Hello everyone, I'm Kayla with McNerdy Makes and welcome back. Today's project has been months in the making and I am so excited to finally bring this project to life. For those that know me, you'll know I'm a huge medieval history nerd and I participate in a group called the Society for Creative Anachronism with other medieval history nerds. For those that know me well, you'll know that I'm absolutely fascinated with medieval Ireland. So before we begin, just FYI, condensing hundreds of hours of research into this small video was an incredibly painful process. I'm very proud of the work that I've done, so it's hard to figure out what's the most important to keep. So if you're looking for more information or you'd like to recreate this dye recipe for yourself, I've linked my research paper down below absolutely free and open source. I've also created chapters for this video, so you can just skip ahead if you're not really interested in the history and just want to move on to the dye experiment. But if you're not interested in history, then I don't really know why you're here watching a video on a 16th century dyeing recipe. Anyway, chapters, moving on. What started everything on this project was wanting to create a late medieval Irish wardrobe for my persona in the SCA. I settled on the 15th century for my representation and will be making several pieces to complete this outfit. But working our way up from the foundation, no medieval outfit is complete without a shift or a chemise. Typically, I honestly can't stand making shifts. They're just so boring and I wanna get to the pretty fun parts like the gown. But the Irish in particular have some pretty insanely unique and gorgeous garments like the one that prompted this video here, the Lena. Their shirts be very strange, not reaching past the thigh. With pleats on pleats they pleated are, as thick as pleats may lie, whose sleeves hang trailing down almost unto the shoe, and with a mantle commonly, the Irish carm do go. So the Lena, or Lenta in its plural form, simply means shirt. It was a genderless garment worn by everyone, with quite a few distinct characteristics. I'll be going over more of my research about the Lena in the actual construction video, but for right now, some pertinent information to have. The garment that I'm making wouldn't have been possible for someone that wasn't obscenely wealthy. The Victorians ain't got nothing on these poofy freaking sleeves, y'all. It was reported that the average Lena was between 30 and 35 L's of fabric, which translates roughly to about a modern day to 8 to 10 yards. It was also often referred to as the saffron shirt and called bright or gel in Irish. And seeing as how the lena is the base garment next to the skin, it needs to be washed frequently. So dyeing massive amounts of fabric that need to be washed often with a very expensive herb is just pretty much the epitome of conspicuous consumption. Basically a way of saying, look how much money I have. Does someone want to start a counter on how many times I say the word saffron in this video? Cause it's not even going to be a word by the time we're finished here. So I hadn't planned on dyeing fabric for this project at the very beginning. I was just going to purchase some yellow linen and call it a day. I've really never dyed anything before, say for a couple of small rip projects and uh, they did not come out well. So my particular interest for swimming about in uncharted territory came from this book right here, Dress in Ireland by Maria Dunlevy. This was sent to me by my lovely friend Kira Una, link to her channel down below if you'd like to go and show her some love. This book is a fantastic wealth of information about Irish dress, including this recipe from the 16th century. The Reverend Father Good wrote in 1566 that the clothes were dyed yellow through heating together the boughs, bark, and leaves of the poplar trees, along with the bark of the wild arbutus, salt, and saffron with urine as a mordant. He said that in dyeing their way is not to boil the thing long, but to let it soak for some days together in wine that the color may be deeper and more durable. I was super happy to come across this recipe, and despite my inexperience, I decided to try and replicate it. Since there's no specific information in this recipe about amounts or a process or anything like that, I wanted to find the original document to see if there was any more information I could glean about it. After weeks of research, the oldest version of the recipe I could find was from Camden's Britannia in 1586. However, there were some differences between the two quotes. Camden's Britannia says, With the boughs, bark, and leaves of poplar trees bruised and stamped, they dye their shirts a saffron color, which are much now out of use, mixing the bark of the wild arbute tree with salt and saffron. In dyeing their way is not to boil the thing long, but to let it soak for some days together in cold urine, that the color may be deeper and more durable. The wine from Dunlevy's quote isn't even mentioned at all, and Camden insists that the urine that was mentioned in her quote was used as a fixative post-dyeing rather than important. This is an ongoing project, and still currently within this research, it's undetermined how the changes between the two recipes occurred. So with questions to answer, I set out to find a copy of Father Good's original writing. Long story short, there are still two copies in existence, and my apologies to the poor archive employees that have had to deal with my hyper-focus and obsession. I was able to get high-resolution photos of some of the original document thanks to my friend Vittorio, who has been translating for me in the Roman archive. Unfortunately, the recipe was not in one of the 10 pages that I was given, however, there are over 100 pages to this document. The archive has kindly agreed to let me take my own photos of the document, however, a trip to Rome isn't anywhere in my near future. 
So if any of you are going to be in Rome anytime soon and you'd like to help, send me a message on Instagram. I, I would greatly appreciate the help. But for now, I'm left to analyze the recipe and attempt to recreate it without the original document. I'll be curious to see what's different and I'll make sure to update everyone when the time comes. So let's move on to the materials list and my test swatches. Since most references to the Lena tend to speak of it being linen, as most undergarments were, I thought it only appropriate to employ that method. I purchased eight yards of 54 inch wide white linen. I have to deduce from the wording of the recipe not only how much of what ingredient to use, but in what order. The first thing mentioned is the boughs, bark, and leaves of the poplar tree. Hello, and welcome to my basement floor. And also, please excuse the attire. We had a snowstorm last night, and it's pretty chilly, so. And yes, it has a tail. So I collected all of these twigs and bark and leaves, and now I have to smash them into tiny little pieces. Let's, uh, Hulk smash. So if you're unfamiliar with natural dyeing, tannins work alongside a mordant to help lock in and retain the color better. Look, I'm not gonna bore you all here with my chemical analysis of poplar trees. That's 100% available in my paper if you're feeling masochistic. All you need to know is that after analyzing the recipe and consulting with some more experienced natural dyers, cottonwood is a perfectly suitable substitute if I'm focused on the tannin content. The cottonwood happens to be the Nebraska state tree and I have plenty of that available near me. I've used bark liquor before in my tanning experiments, so I decided to go that route. Basically, you chop the bark and other bits into little pieces and simmer it on the stove until it becomes a concentrated solution. I'm doing this separately from the dye bath and straining the particulates out so they won't get stuck in the fabric and cause mayhem. Speaking of the Arbutus tree, I could go on and on about the wonderful and amazing facts about this gorgeous tree that I've never heard of. Getting bark shipped from Ireland was uh, not going to happen, as Arbutus unato is a highly protected species. But Arbutus menzisi grows in British Columbia, Canada, and the tan in comparison seemed to work here too. So I called my friend Melissa over at So Biased, who happens to live in the land of maple leaves and hockey. Melissa kindly collected some bark for me from around the bottoms of the trees because it sheds its bark constantly. So Arbutus trees naturally shed their bark year round. You can see here where it's already lost some. And up on the branches, some of them are completely bare. This is also the biggest Arbutus tree I've ever seen. We grow them big in Vancouver. What can I say? She mailed 14 ounces of the bark to me along with a lovely Canadian care package. Ketchup chips are super weird, by the way. She also sent me some gorgeous fabric that I'll be featuring in an upcoming video. Anyway, I used the same bark liquor process that I did for the cottonwood, simmered on the stove and concentrated. The recipe mentions salt as an ingredient, and I know that I've used that in modern dyeing projects. However, alum salts are often used in natural dyeing projects and were commonly used in the 16th century as well. I chose to use alum for this, but in hindsight, I think I'd like to experiment with both to see if there's any difference between the two. Typically, plant dyeing uses a mordant, or a chemical that's designed to use Reverend Good's words, to make the color more deeper and more durable. The salt in this case is the mordant, and I find it interesting because linen is notoriously difficult to dye well. Saffron is one of the few plants that are a substantive dye with linen, meaning that it doesn't need a mordant. But I'm guessing since there are so many other things in this recipe besides the saffron, it needs all the help it can get. Even today, saffron is considered one of the world's most expensive spices. The autumn crocus yields only three stamen that must be hand-picked and dried before they can be used to color food or clothing. It's important to make sure Spanish saffron is the type obtained to use for dyeing rather than American or Indian saffron. That's actually a different plant called safflower. From what I'm gathering, it will still actually yield a yellow color, but much, much more of the material is needed to elicit the same hue. I purchased two ounces of Spanish saffron and it was obscenely expensive. Medieval things, as you do. To prep the saffron for dyeing, I didn't boil the thing long, but I let the saffron steep in the pot like a tea before straining out the particulates. There's going to be more ingredients discussed when we get to the fixative section, but for now let's move on to starting the test swatches. I washed the linen first to remove impurities and then added the fabric to the pot with the cottonwood liquor and enough water to stir the swatches around. It's also important to put the pieces in wet and stir them around frequently so it doesn't come out blotchy. I followed the wording of the recipe from Camden's Britannia since that's the oldest one that I could find. 
I first added the cottonwood liquor to the dye bath and played around with the concentration. Then I added the arbutus liquor to the bath. In the future, I'd like to play around a little bit more with the arbutus and the cottonwood since both are supposed to give kind of a faint yellow color. I really didn't get anything more than a faint tannish color from the swatches and I probably didn't use enough. But since this is the first of many tests I'd like to complete, I was okay with that. Typically, the fabric is mordanted separately and then submerged in the dye bath. But since the recipe mentioned specifically salt together with saffron, I chose to go that route and put them together. I added the alum salts to the bath and then stirred them around until dissolved and immediately added the saffron tea. I knew the color would be bright, but I was absolutely not prepared for just how fluorescent this color is. The color change was almost immediate and I'm really glad that I added a couple of extra swatches in there for experimentation. I held the pot at just under a simmer for the duration of the dye bath, but I chose to pull one of the swatches after five minutes just to see if there was any kind of comparison. I pulled my other swatches at 35 minutes and rinsed one as a control. The rest of the swatches will be used for testing the fixatives. And now the color comparison between the one that was left for a, let's see, it was a total of 35 minutes versus one that had five. So that is a massive color difference. And I don't know, I'm really happy. Like, I like this color, don't get me wrong. It's beautiful, it's bright. But this, this was what I was looking for. And oh my goodness. Ah! It's so perfect. So the fixatives for the two different recipes, one insists on stale urine, the other insists on wine. Which should I go with? I chose four different fixative soaks and I'll explain why. Unwilling to experiment more than I already had for this project, I opted for 10% concentration ammonia in lieu of urine. Oh, that's... Well... <laughs> smells like cat pee. Oh. In hindsight, I wish I'd done a little bit more research into why urine is used. Sure, urine contains ammonia, but it also contains a whole bunch of other things like uric acid that I did not include. Truthfully, I was a little bit grossed out at the thought of collecting my own pee in a bucket for a couple of weeks and letting it chill for this experiment, but perhaps in the future, maybe? I'll wait to see the original recipe before I make up my mind. Even by my modern standards, soaking a large amount of fabric in perfectly drinkable wine seems a bit wasteful, but I still wanted to include it for posterity's sake. I chose to use an undiluted plain white wine for the test swatch, but I included a couple of other theories as well. Wine will turn to vinegar if it's not well-preserved, and medieval wine wasn't full of all the preservatives that we have in the modern-day stuff. There's lots of instances of vinegar being used to shift the pH in natural dye recipes, so I chose to use an undiluted plain distilled vinegar for this. My friend Gerald is an expert in brewing, and when I called to ask his opinion on which wine to use, he also recommended cream of tartar. Cream of tartar is also called lees of wine, and it's a byproduct in the winemaking industry that would have been available back then. Cream of tartar is also used in natural dyeing projects to brighten the color when it's prone to being sad and dull. So I chose to dissolve some in water and drop the test piece into its container. All right, these are gonna be stored in a light-free, reasonably warm environment. They have little labels on the inside of here. So I have the one that was dyed with the first bath and the, uh, the one that was taken out first out of the bath. And then this one that was taken out later. Um, and I split them in half so I have two little swatches over here. So those I'm going to hang on my porch so that they can be exposed to light because I'd like to see how light fast these are. So that way I can do a comparison with these guys over here. So I've got all four containers, steeping, stewing, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, but I'm gonna let those set. It says for some days, I, it's real specific things. So I'm gonna let those sit probably until next Saturday, so a week from today, and see how that does. I might check on them about halfway through the week and see if anything is happening and update you if it is, but we'll see how this turns out. All right, so it is day six since I put these test samples together, and the first thing I wanna do is go over the samples that I put out on my porch to test for light fugitive properties. So we'll see how that turns out. Okay, I am not sure if the camera is going to pick up the difference. There is a slight difference between the ones that I left in the cabinet uh, out of the light and the ones that did get left in the light. You can actually see too where I put a candle 
to hold this one to keep it from moving. And you can just barely see the line that's a little bit darker on the sample than, um, than the rest of it. So it is a little bit light fugitive, but the difference isn't horribly, horribly crazy. You know, like it is light fugitive, but these were also not finished in any sort of material. So, but the difference is much less noticeable with these two samples. There is a slight difference, but not by much. So it's interesting to see. Okay, so this is the results of the experiment. Um, fourth place goes to ammonia. I'm Like I said, I'm not sure if this is showing up on camera, but oh my goodness, that is really light. Like it's even lighter than the ones that I didn't leave in the dye bath very long. So it almost bleached the color out of it. So fourth place goes to wine, similar, Similar results, but a little bit darker. I'm gonna say runner-up goes to cream of tartar. I'm actually a little bit surprised at this. In most of the research I've done, I thought that it would turn out brighter, but in holding it with the brightest shade I've got, there we go. Yeah, even in comparing to the brightest shade I've got, even the vinegar is not quite as bright as that. Again, not really showing up on camera, but take my word for it. All of these are very muted in color, and I'm not understanding why. Maybe I left them in too long. I Maybe it altered the pH too much. I don't know, but still. So this one is the brightest one I've got. This one was the one that was left in the dye bath for 15 minutes on simmer and then 25 just to steep and kept out of the sunlight. So. I think the winner is none of them. So with the results of the fixative soaks and the light fugitivity tests, I decided to dye the main fabric without a fixative. All right, hello, and uh, welcome back to my kitchen. I decided to go with none of the soaks because the brightest color came out of the control. I don't think that any of the soaks are gonna make much of a difference. It's, it's having the opposite effect I want. I love that bright color. I'm also a little short on the saffron. By my calculations, I should need one more ounce. While I really want the color to come out super great, I think that that's just a little bit more than I'm willing to spend right at the moment. I also have another issue here. So I'm going to do my best. I'm gonna heat everything on the stove before I pour it in the pot. And then when I pour it into the pot, I'm going to be frequently stirring and checking the temperature to make sure that it's holding. And hopefully that will be enough. And if I need to, I can always scoop some out and reheat it on the stove and pour it back in. So we shall see how this turns out.
All right, the washer is done. So I am really terrified to open this, but. Oh my goodness, yes. Oh, that's so exciting. It has been several months since I completed this dye project and I entered it into an SEA competition a few months ago and I ended up taking runner up. I'm so pleased with how it turned out, like absolutely floored. And I'm hoping to learn more when I get the photos from the Roman archive, but for now I get to get started on my Lena. Since I put all of this effort into the dye, making it historically accurate, I figured I'd better hand sew this garment. So that's gonna take me some time, but Time to start pulling threads, and in the meantime, check out what's coming up next on McNerdy Makes. <laughs> A pretty hobbit dress. Yikes. I'm going to let a robot decide my next gown, and I'm absolutely terrified. <laughs> um, I, I, this is amazing. I just gotta say that. This is absolutely Are you incredible. touched in your heart by this gown? by a random computer generated image. Honestly, not sure which one to pick. So now that decision falls to you, my friend. Oh my God, I was wrong. That face will haunt my nightmares. 